Lingaland is a freaking a world surrounded by a wall, keeping everyone in. It is believed that the wall is the law above all, and no one is allowed to go out of this wall. There are two major countries in Lingaland, and these are Luthor and Rekka. These two nations rival each other, while the other smaller nations are just there to spectate like a gambler losing their money. In this world are machines that are way cooler but not as cool as Transformers. These machines are called Bryheit. They are operated by humans via the help of a device called the Bind Warper. Luther and Rekka find themselves at a standoff over a bulk load of Bind Warpers that just landed on the continent. The new container of Bind Warpers is known as Rakuho, which is a pretty dumb name if you ask me. Rekka's terrifying bulk mass general, Kai has one of the strongest Brigite on the continent. With this unstoppable machine, Kai is able to push back the enemies. However, something interesting happens when another Rahuko flies past them. The Rahuko then lands in the Forgotten Lands, the Iki territory. The Rakuho lands precisely in Edger Village where a coward and pretty f***ing idiot, Bit lives. The Rakuho lands exactly like a meteorite would, catching the attention of the entire small village. Meanwhile, Rekka's high diviner, Shu, and his assistant, Ren, are headed to the village. With the big container right in the middle of the village, the hungry douchebags assume that the container contains food. Shu and Ren stay in the distance, watching the villagers do whatever it is that they want to do with the Rakuho. Bit is the first to grab a stick, hoping to break open the container so they can get something to eat. Bit continues hitting the container until it pops open with a pop of smoke. Surprisingly, a man jumps out of the container and is not freaking food as expected. The kids are still confused and they assume that the guy is food, forcing them to go after the unclothed guy. Later that night, the new strange guy is given a piece of clothing to wrap his body, and when asked how he came to be, he explains that he is from outside the wall, making him the first person to come from outside the wall. The guy is also suffering from amnesia, which is why he really doesn't know much. The guy wastes no time talking about his desire to return outside the wall. At that moment, it comes to Shu that he has never thought about exploring what is outside the wall. Ren is ready to take out the strange guy with a sniper, when a bandit from Luthor suddenly shows up. The bandit activates his machine, thus putting fear in the villagers. The bandit is there to take whatever treasures are stored inside the Rakuho, but he is shocked when informed that the container contains nothing but the dumb guy, who is pretty standing out from everyone else. The bandit gets mad and starts destroying things. The new guy takes off the wrapper around his waist and decides to fight the bandit. However, there is nothing for him to fight, and to cover his bare body, the village's sheriff Atli gives the guy her father's panties to wear. Atli then decides to fight the bandit by whipping out her warper. The villagers do not want her to do this because it is common knowledge that a person also dies if they die while operating their machine. However, Atli wants to do this because she is the village's sheriff. Atli transforms into a pink-looking machine to fight the bad guy. When the new guy asks the village's doctor what he is looking at, Dr. Sola explains to him that the warper connects to a person's conviction, transforming into a machine for them to wield. Atli is able to hold out against this terrifying and big machine, standing in front of her. The strange guy starts to realize that the machine's power and movement depend on the user's feelings. The battle between Atli and the bad guy continues, but she is now losing. The villagers beg her to remove her warper so she won't die, but the bandit already lashes on at her with his rope preventing her from transforming back into a human. When it becomes glaring that Atli is going to die, the strange new guy runs back to the pod in which he landed. It turns out that there is a warper inside the pod, and he decides to save Atli since she is the one who offered him panties. The guy doesn't really know what he is doing, but he activates the warper, transforming him into a cool-looking blue machine. The guy takes the fight away from the village, and the moment he has the bandit all to himself, he punches him repeatedly, till his machine gets destroyed. However, something quite interesting happens because the bandit doesn't die even after his machine gets destroyed. The bandit gets on his motorbike and runs away before he is grabbed by the villagers. After his departure, the strange guy finally decides to give himself a name, and guess what? He chose the stupidest name ever. Out of all the weird freaking names available in the world, the guy decides to go with Back Arrow. Moments later, Arrow decides that it is time for him to leave for outside the wall. He activates his machine and starts heading to the wall. Not long after this, he gets exhausted because of hunger. He falls to the ground and returns to his normal self, and this is when Shu and Ren show up. Shu is fascinated with Arrow's intentions to go beyond the wall. Shu then tells him just how tall the wall is, and what it is going to take him to go over it. Since the guy is starving like a boar, he is offered meat which he hungrily consumes. Shu then tells Arrow that he would like to help him, but before he can, he wants Arrow to wait a few days in Edger Village. Since Arrow has no reason to doubt the guy, he decides to take him up on his deal. Later on, the villagers find Arrow in front of their door, sleeping like a baby. Some of the kids who saw what happened tell the elders that Arrow was dropped off by a weird lady. 
On the other hand, Shu and Ren return to Rekka. Apparently Shu and Kai are best buddies, but when Kai asks Shu about the second pod, Shu simply tells the guy that he is still working on it. Arrow continues his life in the village, and he is closer to Atli than everyone else. Bit doesn't really like Arrow because he claims that the guy destroyed his house. One of the villagers, Elsha, who is a stern-looking lady, also does not like Arrow. She sees Arrow as nothing but a scumbag. Even the village chief doesn't seem to like Arrow. They find it hard to trust the guy since he claims to be from outside of the wall. Bit and Elsha take Arrow to the edge of the town, telling him how they have been managing their lives in the town before his arrival. They tell him that the town cannot afford additional risks, and by the looks of things, Arrow is a freaking risk. It is evident that the major players will be coming for him since he is an interesting find. The two want Arrow to leave and for his journey, they give him some food and water to keep him going. In Rekka, Shu wants to know more about Arrow and the circumstances surrounding his appearance. Because of this, he has plans to enter the Imperial Archives, but to do this, he needs a seal that only the Prime Minister and the King have with them. However, Shu being the sneaky bastard that he is, already has a copy of the seal with him. Also in Luto, the bandit who attacked the village gives his report. Now in Iki territory, the president is also making a play for Arrow, and this is because of pressure from Luther. Not long after this, the Iki military shows up in Edger, demanding that they surrender themselves and their households for a search. The squad leader is nothing but a scumbag, who actually likes violence but hides behind his military status. Once the villagers are asked where Arrow is and no one is able to produce him, the president orders the squad leader to wipe the village off the map. This is an order that the squad leader happily accepts because that is just who he is. Panic immediately erupts in the village, and when the squad leader activates his machine, Atli also does the same. However, Atli is no match for the guy as she gets bullied. In a desperate attempt for help, Elsha checks inside Arrow's pod, and luckily, she finds a bind warper. Without thinking twice, Elsha activates the warper. This transforms her into her own unique machine, and since she is the one who made Arrow leave, she is ready to defend the village. However, being her first time in such a machine, she finds it hard to easily control it, and ends up falling into the ground. The squad leader continues to wreak havoc, and just when Atli is about to lose her life, she takes off her warper, thus freeing her from her enemy's grip. Brit gets scared amidst chaos and runs toward the well to hide himself, but just when he is about to jump into the well, Arrow emerges from there, and Arrow reveals that he actually promised Shu that he is going to stay in the village for a couple of days. This is the reason he looked for a place to hide till Shu came and got him. Arrow then goes after the bad guy, who is busy wrecking the village. He activates his machine, and he gets into a standoff with the bad guy. Meanwhile, Shu is now learning about the village and the new guy, Arrow. At the same time, Elsha seems to have stumbled upon a hidden treasure located beneath the village. It takes Arrow a few seconds to dish out punishment to the guy disturbing the peace of the village. Arrow beats the guy up, destroying his battle machine. Just then, Elsha emerges from under the ground, and with Elsha is a large warship. This is a shock to everyone, but Arrow is just impressed with Elsha's latest pull. In Rekka, the military guys receive the new batch of warpers, and this is definitely going to give them an edge over their rivals, Luther. It turns out that the Emperor actually knows about the second Rakuho, and he tells Kai to inform Shu that he will be waiting for a report. After the meeting with the king, Kai goes to Shu to ask him what he is really doing. Shu is not ready to reveal his intentions and investigations just yet. Back in Edger Village, there is apparently Apparently nothing left of the village because of the emergence of the warship. Some of the villagers still do not like Arrow because they believe he is the one who destroyed their village. Even the village chief doesn't like Arrow. He thinks Arrow is living in a delusion about not being a citizen of Lingland. Now that everything has settled down, the village does not think of beating up the squad leader, Tyrone, who causes chaos in the village. They think it is normal for them to allow the douchebag to run free. This gives Tyrone the time to get into Bit's head. Bit is the dumb guy, and Tyrone knows this, so he targets the guy for his evil plans. Later on, Arrow wakes up to find himself in bondage. Apparently, Tyrone has convinced Bit to convince the villagers to hand Arrow over to them. This is a shock to Arrow, who basically just saved them, again. Later that night, Atli shows up to save Arrow. She points a gun at Bit, telling him to untie the guy. Atli cannot believe that Bit is actually okay with sacrificing someone else just to save his skin. Atli sees Arrow as a savior who saved the village, but they want to throw him under the bus without thinking twice. Before Atli can get to save Arrow, Elsha shows up, pointing a gun at Atli. She tells Atli that Bit is actually right, because it is normal for them to sacrifice just one guy if it means the restoration of their village. Even though she is outnumbered, Atli is not ready to give in. However, Arrow cuts in, telling Atli that it is all fine. Arrow himself is ready to be sacrificed because he doesn't want anyone to suffer. Arrow seems like a chill guy who actually understands everyone's perspective about things. The following morning, Everyone gets aboard the warship with a promise from the president that they are going to be given a new village to settle in as a reward for handing over Arrow. The ship lifts off the ground and heads out to its supposed village.
village. Arrow is locked in a cage while Tyrone walks about the ship in a very bubbling fashion. Atli is still against the idea of them sacrificing Arrow, but everyone else just seems to be cool with it. Not long after this, the ship arrives at the location where the president is waiting for them. The president happily receives Arrow and also confiscates his warper. The villagers are shown a video of what their new home looks like and this makes them really happy. When the president is asked what will happen to Arrow, he reveals that Arrow will be handed over to Luto. Just then, Bit begs Tyrone to enlist him in the military because he wants to serve. Bit knows Atli now hates him, so there is no reason for him to go back to the village. Bit is trying to start a new path by redeeming himself, he believes. Just then, the president gives Bit a rope to pull, and the moment he does this, he realizes that it is nothing but an explosive's trigger. The explosion causes the canyon to start collapsing on the ship, and Tyrone's men trigger the remaining explosives, burying the ship under a rubble. Bit is shocked to see this, and it finally dawns on him that they have been tricked. The president planned to wipe out the village, and Tyrone only deceived Bit because he is nothing but gullible. In a desperate attempt to right his wrong, Bit grabs the president, but when the man shakes him off, Bit has already stolen Arrow's warper from him. Bit risks his life to get the warper to Arrow, begging him to save the village even though they have acted selfishly toward him. Arrow transforms into the blue machine and grabs Bit before he gets killed. He puts Bit in one of the machine's compartments and leaps off to try and help the villagers. He gets to the ship, and even though the villagers don't think they are worthy of his help, Arrow doesn't hold back in getting the ship back to an optimal state. The ship comes out from under the rubble, but Tyrone is not ready to let them go. He takes a warper and attacks the ship, but Atli decides to take him on this time around. With her strong conviction, Atli is able to hold out against Tyrone until Arrow shows up to finish him off. With this, the villagers make their way out of there, deciding to find a place of their own along the way. They also come to a unanimous decision to name the warship Granager. Meanwhile, Shu is given the mission of finding and eliminating Arrow. Fifteen years ago, Shu and Kai were orphans, who suffered at the hands of the system. However, their suffering actually shaped them into the great men they have become. In the present day, Kai tells Shu that he is worried about him, but Shu assures the guy that he has everything under control. To achieve his plans, Shu hires four mercenaries known as the Four to cause chaos in a neutral zone. These four are exceptional with their machines and in no time, the entire building is down without the defense not being able to do shit against them. On the other hand, Edger Village is looking for a safe and easy route that they can use in navigating. The size of the ship is a factor that they need to look at when making their plans. Dr. Sola suggests that they pass through the neutral zone to avoid clashing with Luther and Rekka. While they are busy making plans, Shu and the Rekka army corner them. A pre-recorded message from the Emperor is played for the villagers, and they are informed that the army is there to wipe them out. The Emperor tells them that there will be no negotiation, which means the ship either finds a way to get out of the mess, or freaking die. Since they now know their fate, Dr. Sola tells them about a region where they can actually pass through. Immediately Elsha activates the ship and tries to bulldoze their way out of danger. The four mercenaries are with Shu, and it is time for them to shine. Shu withdraws the army so that the four can handle the ship. Shu then halts the ship's movement by activating a technology known only to him. The four are now face to face with Arrow and Atli. While they are standing there, looking at each other like a bunch of fools, Shu pulls up. Arrow is shocked to see the guy because he was the one who told him to wait in the village and not go yet. After a brief and not so necessary introduction, Shu pulls out. He orders the four to eliminate the Arrow and his associate while at it. The four mercenaries introduce themselves before before taking on their opponents. Shu stands in the distance, watching the entire thing with excitement on his face. Ren realizes that Shu might actually have something else planned out, and she reminds the guy that the mission precedes whatever it is that he is trying to do. Shu replies by telling Ren that he is a genius, which means not everyone can understand him or what he is trying to do. On the other hand, Luther is with the belief that the neutral zone was attacked by people affiliated with Rekka. Elsha joins the fight between the four and his comrades. She is nothing but a drawback in the fight because she lacks the experience and even the fighting skills. Not long after this, Arrow is knocked to the ground and ready to be pulverized. One of the fours makes fun of him, telling him that his beginner's luck is definitely not going to work when it comes to them. This gets Arrow pretty mad, and he decides to get serious with them. Arrow steals his conviction, and with this, he is able to produce physical clones of his machine. These clones are pretty dangerous dangerous because they carry the same punch that the real Arrow carries. With the help of his clones, Arrow is able to beat the four up simultaneously. Arrow ends up defeating them, leaving Shu to wonder just how many more discoveries need to be made. Shu knows that Arrow is a very interesting character, which makes him even more exciting to study. Just then, Ren orders the army to surround Arrow and take him down, 
but surprisingly, Shu reveals his true intentions. He presses a button on his master trigger, and it deactivates all of their weapons and machines alike. Shu makes his way to Arrow, telling the guy that he wants to surrender. Even Arrow is shocked because Shu and the army were basically about to win thanks to their numbers. Arrow reveals that he is interested in Arrow, and he only pulled a stunt to see how strong and capable Arrow is. Ren cannot believe what she is seeing, but there is nothing she can do because Shu has restricted her to the motorcycle. Shu then tells the army and Ren to leave. Without argument, the army leaves, but Shu stays behind. Once the army is gone, the villagers demand that Shu undo whatever rubbish he did to the ship so it can start moving again. She explains to them that the ship was rendered immobile, all thanks to a substance known as decoupling spray. Ren returns to Rekka with tears in her eyes, as she tells Kai that their friend has betrayed them. A flashback scene shows how Shu first located his first Rakuho, using his well-put calculations. Shu and Kai run over there only to find a rebel army also waiting to grab the treasures that are inside the pod. Kai manages to take out the rebel army all by himself, and not long after this, the official Rekka army shows up. Prime Minister Tai is present, and he doesn't even acknowledge the fact that Kai single-handedly fought the enemies. Tay orders that both Shu and Kai be eliminated, but luckily for the two, the Emperor, Zetsu shows up to save them. This was the first time that Kai and Shu would come across the Supreme Leader. Now in the present day, Kai ventures out to find Shu, and probably drags him back to Rekka. Shu is trying to figure out everything on the warship when Kai shows up in front of them. He manifests into his machine, ready to take down the ship. Shu lets them know that Kai is going to be a big problem because he alone is equivalent to 1,000 machines. Kai displays his strength by stopping the ship's advance. The first person Kai goes after is Elsha. He knocks her out of her machine to make sure the ship doesn't move further. Arrow wants to fight Kai, but Shu advises against this, telling him that Kai is going to easily end him. Kai demands that Shu come out of the ship to see him. Kai wants to know the motivation behind what Shu is doing. Shu replies that he has found new plans for himself, and Arrow is the backbone of the plan. Shu believes that Rekka is nothing but a sinking ship, and this is the reason he needs to jump ship. Kai is interested in saving Rekka, while Shu wants to save the world. After hearing this, Kai tells Shu that he doesn't mind destroying the ship and Arrow along with it. Just then, Arrow steps out of the ship to have a one versus one with Kai. The two get down to introductions before charging toward each other. Kai spins Arrow around with his giant sword, and when he is about to deliver the finishing blow, Arrow pulls a classic by creating multiple clones of himself to confuse Kai. With the help of his clones, he is able to exploit an opening, and he pushes his hand into Kai's chest. Everyone immediately jumps up to celebrate because they assume that Arrow has defeated Kai. However, Shu tells them not to celebrate just yet. Shu knows just how strong and formidable Kai is. Just then, Kai surprises Arrow by releasing a burst of energy from his chest to knock the guy to the ground and immobilize him. At this point, the spineless village chief is already begging Arrow and Shu to just leave them alone because they have been nothing but trouble for them. Shu then replies that the village is still not safe even with him and Arrow gone because Zetsu is not going to stop until he destroys the warship, which he considers a huge threat. Shu finally steps out to meet with Kai in an attempt to defuse the situation. Shu sits down with Kai as they both discuss like old buddies. Shu lets Kai know that he is not interested in going back to Rekka and Kai reminds him of the promise they made to each other. The two both promised each other to be great and also to make the country great. They even cut their arm as a pact for this but when Kai shows his own scar, Shu reveals that his own scar has healed so there is no need for him to honor their agreement and promise any further. Kai angrily grabs Shu by the neck while Shu tells him the reason why he is doing everything that he is doing. Kai still doesn't think Shu's explanations cut it, and he whips out his sword to strike down Shu. Bit appears from behind and tries to shoot Kai but Kai easily knocks him down. Kai is not interested in killing Bit or anyone else. Kai walks towards Shu with the sword in hand, ready to strike him down. Just then, Arrow jumps in to block the attack. Arrow scolds Kai for trying to kill his old friend without batting an eye. Kai and Arrow are about to have a second battle, but Shu calls Kai's attention to things. The ship raises its battle cannons and fires into the air. Just then, an explosion rocks Rekka's capital. Shu tells Kai that the ship can target a place as far as the capital, which means they can easily destroy the capital from where they are. Kai doesn't want to believe this until another explosion hits, causing panic. Ren communicates with Kai, telling him what is happening in the capital. Kai values civilians' lives and because of this, he decides to back off. However, he tries to terminate Shu again, but Arrow blocks the attack. Kai then leaves the scene after telling Shu that he is now his greatest enemy. After Kai leaves, Shu reveals that everything that happened is nothing but a bluff. Apparently Shu covered his scar to make it seem like he didn't care. At the same time, the cannons they fired were nothing because they had not figured out how to use the ship's weapon system just yet. Shu had previously placed bombs in strategic locations in the city, and this was what he was activating using his master trigger. Basically Shu just put their lives on the line by putting on a show. However, Shu tells the team that they need to sort things out pretty quickly, before Kai figures out that the explosions are a bluff. 
Since Kai failed to complete his mission, the Emperor tells Tai to put Kai on a personal punishment. Ren also switches her loyalty to Kai since Shu has betrayed them. As the journey continues, the group sees a signpost about a pretty boy farm which sounds really interesting. Bit also comes up with his usual weird and stupid takes, but Shu is not ready to deal with his shit. Shu just suggests that the guy becomes the admiral of the ship, and he gladly accepts the role, even though he is being trolled without even freaking realizing it. Elsha is also in the infirmary, receiving treatments after their last encounter with Kai. Shu is able to keep the ship going even without Elsha on the prow. Another feat to add to Shu's collection is his finding out certain hidden rooms on the ship. This makes the villagers happy and more comfortable. The ship is more or less a home without them even realizing it. There is a storeroom, bedrooms, kitchen, and the like on the ship. In Rec Kai is still punishing himself for failing his mission, but things get even more interesting when Minister Kyo shows up to deliver another piece of bad news. Ren is being subjected to punishment for failing to know about Shu's secret plans. Emperor Zetsu is currently not in the nation because he is out fighting rebels. This means Tai holds all the power and the guy really hates Kai. Ren will be subjected to a trial in the next three days, unless she is able to prove herself. She is free to do whatever she wants for the next three days, but these days might be her last. The ship managed to evade all of Luther's roots and soon found themselves in Walston province. This is an autonomous province, but they still pay taxes to Luther. They have no choice but to pass through here because Shu believes his fake plan will be revealed in the next couple of days. Shu wants them to reach the wall before then. Not long after this, they arrive at Walston province, and out of nowhere, a kid wearing his armor shows up, trying to stop the ship. Arrow gets the boy out of the way before he gets killed. After this, the kid passes out in his arms. When he wakes up, the boy takes the crew to where he stays. Apparently, the boy is a pretty boy, and he is staying with other pretty boys on a farm. The crew brings food for the starving boys, who rush out in excitement to eat. The pretty boy explains to the crew that he and his friends were livestock for the land ruler, Walston. They are basically lab rats who had their brains pried into. However, the pretty boy was able to escape one day by getting his hands on a warper. He then uses this to break his friends out of the lab. They join him, and together, they go after the other labs to break the enslaved boys free. After hearing this, Arrow suggests that the boys come with them because they are going beyond the wall, but the boys do not want to. They have lived in the region all their lives, but it was Waxton who came to ruin everything. Just then, Walston shows up at the farm, and he is with his army. Arrow, being the troublemaker he is, decides to go after Walston, and possibly punish him for being a douchebag. Arrow easily takes down Walston's defense, but doesn't hurt Walston or his people. Arrow only chases them away, telling them never to disturb the pretty boys again. Later that day, the leader of the pretty boys tells Arrow that his conviction is basically to survive, and this is the reason he is kind of weak. Seeing how pathetic the boy looks, Arrow comes up with an idea. Arrow then decides to visit Walston at his castle. Arrow takes Shu and Bit with him to the guy's castle. Walston almost shits his body when he sees Arrow at his house. However, Arrow and Shu assure him that they are there to make a deal. Not long after this, the pretty boys are surprised to see Arrow with Walston. It seems Arrow, Shu, and Bit have decamped to Walston's side. Apparently, they need a map of Luther from him, and before he can do this, he wants them to help capture the kids so he can continue experimenting on them. The ship's crew and the pretty boys are shocked to see this. Walston even brought all the warpers he has in his collection just because he wants to get the kids back. The leader of the boys feels betrayed and angrily goes after Arrow. They release a smoke bomb into the area, blinding Walston and his men. Before he knows it, the pretty boys have stolen his warper collections. The kids transform into their battle form, and this is when Shu and Arrow reveal that everything is nothing but a farce. It was all a plan all along. Arrow wanted to push the pretty boys to stand up for themselves and stop being afraid. In addition to this, they now have warpers to defend themselves which means Walston can no longer disturb them. As for the map, Shu had already memorized it when they were at his castle. After giving the pretty boys their freedom, the ship and its crew leave the following day. The ship continues its journey toward the neutral zone, and Bit thinks that it is a good idea if they name the Bryites. He already has a cool name for each Bryites in their collection. Shu then points out the fact that they are being followed by a Rekka general. By. Shu admits the fact that this general is nothing but trouble. However, he cannot attack them just yet because they are in the neutral zone. There is a treaty between Luther and Rekka not to conduct business on neutral soil. Shu is somewhat worried that Zetsu might be willing to break the treaty just to attack the ship. Just then, the village chief and some of the citizens reveal their desires to leave the ship, but Elsha tells the old man that they cannot stop the ship at the moment. They have no choice but to continue going forward. In Luthor, the princess condemns Walston for attacking Edger's battleship. Apparently, Princess Fine of Luthor, who is the ruler, is an advocate of peace, and she doesn't like anything violent. She scolds Walston but lets him go. Walston being the dumbass he is, leaves the palace to start trash-talking the princess. Out of nowhere, the princess's personal guard, Commander Prax, shows up to cut his hand. Prax is a stern lady who doesn't tolerate nonsense. 
She tells Walston about respecting the princess and the consequences that come with not doing so. Two of the ministers, Peeth and Baran, are tasked to bring the battleship to the nation without trouble, but they are having difficulties with this. Prax then decides to get on the mission by herself. When the ship arrives at the wall, they start making efforts to break it down, but nothing they have done so far has left even a tiny dent on the wall. Meanwhile, Ren is looking for clues concerning Shu's plan and all. Ren manages to remember something that Shu once told her, and with this, she is able to uncover the rest of the explosives that the guy has planted in the city. At the same time, Bai wants Tai to give him permission to attack the battleship, but Tai cannot do this since the ship is standing in the neutral zone. The Emperor is also not in the country to make such a hard decision. At the wall, Shu tries using the ship's cannon to blow the wall, but even the ship's powerful gun turns out to be totally useless against the thick and supposedly indestructible wall. Just then, a giant exhaust emerges from the wall, pushing the ship away from its location. This further proves to Shu that the wall is actually man-made. The ship gets pushed out of the neutral zone to Rekka's land and this is what Bai has been waiting for. Bai wastes no time in seizing the opportunity to go after the ship. This guy also seems to be a superpower, as he is able to handle Arrow and his comrades at the same time. The ship cannot also shoot Bai because he is in the ship's blind spot. The ship tries to run back to the neutral zone, but Bai grinds them down with the decoupling spray. The army is now trying to get on the ship, but Atli and the others are there to repel them. Arrow is having a really tough time with Bai, and he is about to get trashed to death using his giant axe, when a Bryhite suddenly shows up and whisks Bai away. Everyone is shocked to see this because this is the first time they are going to be witnessing a flight-type Bryhite. The person operating the machine turns out to be Prax. She tells them that she is there on behalf of Princess Fine. Bai gets angry when he hears this because a Luther citizen is currently in Rekka. However, Prax lets Bai know that she is not breaking any rules. She has not stepped foot in Rekka, and this is the law. There was no law about airspace because there had never been any machine with flight ability before. In the middle of this, Shu is able to get the ship off the ground and get it back to the neutral zone. Prax grabs Bai once again and throws him around till the ship and Arrow are able to get back to the neutral zone. Once this is achieved, Prax gently lands on her foot and warns Bai not to attack, because anything he does in the neutral zone will be an act of war. After everything settles down, Prax reveals the reason why she is there. It turns out that Princess Fine wants Arrow and the ship to come to Luther. She has promised them safe passage because she is interested in them. Shu immediately agrees to the offer because Luther is known to be a leading nation when it comes to scientific advancement. However, Arrow says he is not interested in going because all he wants to do is destroy the wall. Since Arrow is not going, Prax tells them that only the ship will make do, but she will be back to convince Arrow. Apparently Sola will also be staying behind with Arrow. Now in Rekka, Ren tells Kai about the bombs, and how angry she is that Shu probably sees her as nothing but a puppet. Kai and Ren have now made Shu their biggest enemy, and they cannot wait to bury him. On their way to Luther, Shu explains to the crew how Luther is operated. Apparently, they have six heads of state known as the Supreme Six, but Princess Fine sits on the nation's throne. She is also a woman of peace, who has no desire for war. Soon afterward, the ship arrives at Luthor, and they are welcomed with warm hands. On the other hand, Zetsu is done taking out rebels, and it is time for him to return to his land. It also seems the Emperor is planning to strike Luther. Upon arriving at Luther, the villagers are led to the dining hall where they get to eat till their fill. At the wall, Arrow is having a pretty hard time breaking down the structure. He has tried everything he knows but doesn't work. Arrow is now getting tired since his dream to go beyond the wall is starting to fade off. Alti and Elsha take off their clothes to have a bath but they find the princess in the same pool that they want to use. The two are shy to stand in front of royalty but she tells them not to, because she sees them as equals. Since Elsha and Alti basically hold the village together, Fine believes they are on the same status as her. Fine even takes it as far as telling the two that they can wash her body. After leaving the water, Parax is there to take care of her. Parax is always by the princess's side and she does whatever the princess tells her to do. At the wall, Arrow is now missing his friends, but he has Sola as his company. Even though he misses them, he still wants to break the wall, so he can use that to apologize to the villagers. Just then, Prax appears out of nowhere, and she grabs Arrow. She tells Arrow that she is taking him to Luther whether he likes it or not. Prax's conviction is her devotion to the princess, and this is the reason she is going to do whatever it is that the princess wants. Arrow gets mad and manifests into his armor, in an attempt to stop Prax from forcefully taking him to Luther. Arrow is able to grab Prax by the neck, and he orders her to fly him to the sky since she has the flight ability. However, there are things that Arrow doesn't know about the sky, and Prax is ready to show him. Prax flies Arrow to the sky, but to his surprise, there is a defense system put in place to shoot people down. 
Prax explains to Arrow that they are locked in this world and someone really doesn't want them to leave. Even after seeing this, Arrow is still not ready to follow Prax back to Luther. However, Prax decides that it is time to force the guy. She beats him around, trying to weaken him, but in the middle of this, a Rakuho pod flies past, and Arrow decides to use this to get away. In Luthor, the ministers are trying to get Shu to turn over Rekka's secrets, but Shu has something else in mind. Shu tells the ministers that he is aware of the flight ability that Prax now uses, but he is also very sure that she is the only one who can. However, Shu is ready to help Luther hand in hand so that they can mass produce the warpers. Prax chases after Arrow, and she manages to intercept him before he can even get away. He knocks him out and whisks him away to the capital where the princess is waiting to see him. Meanwhile, the villagers are having all the fun that they have not had in years. After Shu is done making a deal with the ministers, he tells them he needs to head to the ship to get Rekka's map that they asked for. The monsters then give him two escorts to follow him, but Shu already has something in store for them because he doesn't trust the ministers. Bit is hiding on the ship, and he manages to distract the guards while Shu knocks them out. On the other hand, Arrow is now strapped to a slab in a laboratory. It seems Luther is just not who they seem to be. The mad scientist who is to work on Arrow has a lady watching over him. The lady dresses like Prax but has a mask over her face. The scientist plans to dig into Arrow head and brain to figure out why he is able to operate the machines even without a conviction. He pushes electrodes into Arrow's head, and to his surprise, there really is no conviction. Arrow screams out in pain, asking Prax why she is doing what she is doing. Meanwhile, Shu and Bit have been able to locate the lab. Shu points to a red button that Bit needs to shoot if they are to free Arrow from his bondage. Bit needs to pull this off, or else Arrow is gone. Just when the doctor is about to plug the electrode into Arrow's head, Bit manages to hit the red button, freeing Arrow from the slab. Arrow jumps from the slab and plugs the electrodes into the scientist's head instead. Shu drops a smoke bomb, giving them the chance to run away from the room. However, the masked lady chases after them. She and Arrow cross swords and Arrow manages to cut off the lady's mask, revealing their biggest shock yet. It turns out that the lady under the mask is not Prax, but the princess herself. With the looks of things, Fine has an alter ego, and she is ready to unalive them, because they now know her dark secret. Fine continues chasing after them, seriously aiming to unalive them. Fine's alter ego seems to be a violent person, which is the complete opposite of Fine's peaceful behavior. After chasing them for a few minutes, Prax shows up and humbly begs the princess to leave the trio to her. She promises to chop them to pieces, and after Fine is satisfied with what Prax said, she happily leaves. At this point, Shu can only wonder just how many more secrets Luther is hiding. Arrow manifests himself in his armor to fight Parax effectively, while protecting Shu and Bit. He grabs the two and drops them in his armor compartment before making a run for it. On the other hand, Fine uses the secret entrance to her room, and upon arriving at her room, she returns to normal, but knows she has done something really terrible. At the same time, Atli is planning to leave the city to find Arrow, only to look into the distance to see Prax and Arrow fighting each other. Arrow puts up a good fight, but in the end, Prax knocks him down, forcing him to go back to his normal self. Prax also does the same, because she intends to unalive Arrow with dignity. Just when she is about to do this, Sola appears out of nowhere, and gets Arrow out of harm's way. In a twist of things, it turns out that Sola is Prax's brother, and this is the reason he didn't want to come to Luthor in the first place. Apparently Sola is responsible for whatever is happening to the princess, and he left purposely because of this, in an attempt to find a cure. Prax is not ready to hear whatever shit her brother wants to say. She is about to come after the poor guy, but Sola gets them out of sight using a flash screen. They escape to an abandoned building on the outskirts of the town. This is when Sola tells them the story behind Fine's incident. Fine was always a cool and happy girl who had the dream of inventing a kite so she could ride on it. Not long after this, Fine was able to invent the kite, and while riding the kite with Prax, Sola accidentally shoots them down, believing that they were being attacked by a bird. They crash landed, but the princess made it, and not long after this, she was chosen as the Princess Supreme. After she was enthroned, her split personality showed up, but Prax and Sola kept it a secret. Even when Sola tried to tell someone else, Prax warned him not to. Sola later tries to tell the ministers, but Prax shows how serious she is when she poisons Sola. Sola managed to live, but this showed him just how dedicated Prax was to the princess. That very day, Sola escaped from the city, and he became a doctor in an attempt to cure the princess. Now in Rekka, Zetsu is preparing to invade Luthor. The first thing he does is to free Kai from prison, since he has served enough punishment for his sins. After this, Zetsu gathers the people at the arena because he has something important to show them. Zetsu plans to execute the rebel chief publicly, and to do this, he gives the rebel a warper to fight with. This is a shock to everyone because the old man doesn't have a warper to fight back. To even make things interesting, he tells the rebel that he is free to become the emperor if he manages to defeat him. Everyone else is scared, but it seems Kai can sense the powerful aura coming from Zetsu, and he knows that he is not losing to the likes of the rebel chief. The battle between the two begins, and all Zetsu arms himself with is a thread spinner. With a few spins, Zetsu easily takes down the giant machine. 
The entire arena is left flabbergasted and Tai can only classify Zetsu in the monster category. Zetsu is so powerful that he doesn't need a machine to take down his enemies. After showing how powerful he is, Zetsu publicly declares his intentions to invade Luther and bring them to their knees. Kai is also excited by this because he just cannot wait to put Shu in the ground. Now in Luther, the villagers of Edger have been locked up by Fine's alter personality. The village chief cannot but wonder why they are always the ones to suffer every misfortune that gets distributed on the planet. Prax is always ready to stand by the princess's dual personality no matter the decision she makes. Later on, Zetsu sends a war message to Fine, but the message meets her violent alter ego, and she immediately accepts the challenge. Rekka will be invading Luther in three days' time, and the princess tells Zetsu and his army to bring it on. Immediately after this, Fine contacts her mad scientist, telling him to prepare everything they have so that they can meet Rekka head-on. Fine's dual personality showcases itself in front of the ministers, and finally, they know the secret that Prax has been hiding so badly from everyone. Fine's violent self takes over fully, making it hard for the peaceful personality to even switch back on. The whole country goes on full mode alert in preparation for the war. Sola learns about the new development when in town and when he goes back to the Hidut, he tells the trio about this. However, Shu figures out that he was followed, and before he even finishes his sentence, the building is attacked by a Bryhite. Before they start running for their lives, a girl dressed as a clown shows up, and with just a gesture, she sends away the machine. Apparently, the clown works for someone quite powerful, and she takes them to her boss, who lives in a clownish home too. Sola knows who they are going to meet, and upon entering the house, they come across a big, overfed man, who is still eating upon their arrival. Sola tells the trio that the man they are looking at is the Elect Supreme. Apparently, he is the most powerful man in the nation. Arrow arrogantly walks toward the man, but this is when the man's aura explodes like a bomb, showcasing just how powerful he is. The Elect Supreme tells the team that he is quite aware that he is strong, but he himself doesn't know the true extent of his power. Inside his house are the other princes and princesses who are not picked for the throne. Instead of killing them, he just keeps them in his house as slaves. Just then, the Elect Supreme tells the team something quite big. It turns out that his blood was transfused into Fine when she got into the kite accident, and this is probably the reason she now has a dual personality. The man had never said anything about this before because no one had asked. On the other hand, Fine has gathered the villagers to the arena. Fine wants Elsha to fight or swear loyalty to her. Since Elsha is the only one who can make the battleship move, Fine wants her defeated or better still chopped off her legs. Elsha also has no choice but to fight because the villagers will be terminated if she doesn't. After leaving the Elect Supreme's residence, Arrow and the other two get attacked by the military, who are after them. Elsha proposes a deal for the villages to be released if she wins the duel. The princess doesn't want to accept the deal, but Prax manages to convince the princess since she is confident that Elsha can never beat her in battle. The battle between the two begins, and Prax is nowhere near Elsha's level when it comes to power and everything else. When Arrow gets trapped by the military, Arrow being the ever-evolving person he is, finds a way of escaping the military. At that moment, Arrow's machine develops wings, and he flies out of there with Shu and Bit, perfectly tucked away in the machine's compartment. Prax is dishing out punishment to Elsha, and is about to finish her off, when Arrow bursts into the arena, and knocks Elsha to the wall. Everyone is shocked to see Arrow flying, and this is just one of the amazing things he has done since he has surfaced. Arrow wants to take on Prax, but Elsha refuses. She wants to be the one to finish the fight without anyone interfering. Arrow understands where she is coming from, but instead of leaving her to her own, Arrow transforms into a sword and presents himself to Elsha. With this sword, Elsha gets an advantage in the fight. Fine wants to stop the battle, but Prax refuses, telling the princess that her honor as a knight will become sullied if she does that. Elsha and Prax jump into a heated battle that almost brings down the arena, but with the help of the sword, Elsha is able to destroy Prax's suit. Fine screams out in pain, believing that Prax is dead. This forces out her peaceful personality, but thankfully, Prax is safe because she was cut by Arrow's suit. Fine is happy to see that Prax is safe, but just then, the evil Fine takes over again. Fine is not ready to honor the agreement that they had before the fight. Fine grabs a warper so she can finish the job by herself. However, this is her mistake because the peaceful Fine is able to overpower her evil self while she is trying to transform. The good vibe uses the warper to finally seal her evil self, never to hear from her. Once everything settles down, Fine suggests that Edger Village leave so that they don't get dragged into the war, but the villagers refuse. They are ready to help Fine and Luther in the war against Rekka. Back in Rekka, Zetsu mobilizes his army, and he personally leads them out to battle. The mad scientist is busy working on the warpers, but now, he has Shu to help him. He wants to figure out how Arrow uses the suit without conviction, and when he is not looking, Shu steals a bunch of warpers. 
At the same time, the princess is worried that the nation will be destroyed if they manage to lose in the war. However, Alti and Elsha assure her that they are not going to lose. At the war meeting, Shu tells the war council that Zetsu and his army are going to invade Luther at their strongest point. Shu knows Zetsu will want to show the world how strong he is, and the reason he needs to be the one ruling. This is the reason he is going to want to enter Luthor, where it is considered the most difficult and impenetrable. Shu assures them that Zetsu is going to want to take the head on. The princess takes this into account, and she tells her officials that the fight they are about to take on is a war to save their nation. Later on, Prax scolds Sola for being a spineless idiot. Sola has given up on his will as a fighter ever since he shot down the princess. However, Prax tells him to redeem himself by fighting in the war about to come. Once the war meetings are over, everybody heads out to their posts. Arrow, Shu, and the warship are posted to the least protected area that leads into Luther. Shu knows Zetsu will also post Kai to this region, and he is already hoping that they run into each other. Shu's dream to make Arrow the leader of this world still stays valid, and everything he is doing points in the direction. At the Viola Canyon, which is Luther's strongest point, the Rekka army shows up, and a fierce battle erupts. Bai and some other powerful generals are the first to lead the way. Luther has powerful beams to resist the enemies and Prax is leading the charge. Not long afterward, the ship runs into Kai and Ren, who are both aiming to teach Shu a lesson. Arrow jumps out of the ship to engage Kai, but his opponent ends up being Ren. Ren is boiling from anger, and she wants an opportunity to take Shu out. Ren is fighting over zealously just because she wants Arrow out of the way. The Rekka army also tries boarding the ship, but this is not possible because the ship's defense is now active. As the fight between Ren and Arrow continues, Arrow shows her just how evolved he has become by escaping her wrath thanks to his clones. He flies off and manages to get to Kai before he gets to the ship. Arrow grabs Kai and throws him into the air, giving the ship the chance to hit him with multiple shots. Shu's plan is to weaken Kai so he won't be able to fight. This plan works out pretty well as the ship's cannon is able to deal a great amount of damage to knock Kai to the ground. Arrow is about to end everything when Ren comes dashing in like a mad woman. Arrow hits her and destroys her suit instead. However, Ren has something else in store. It turns out that she already strapped explosives to her body just because she wanted to take out her enemy so badly. However, Arrow is able to get to her before she can press the trigger. Ren tries unaliving Arrow by using a knife. Arrow gets the upper hand, and he knocks Ren to the ground and starts to scold her. Arrow calls her a self-centered person for trying to terminate herself just because she is following orders. Arrow throws her to the ground, transforms back into his suit, and morphs into a sword. Arrow then presents himself to Atli to use. With the sword, Atli takes out the entirety of the army platoon in the area. Both Kai and Ren have been defeated by the ship's crew. The ship flies past them, but there is nothing they can do about it since they are basically fighting for their lives. When Zetsu realizes that Prax is making waves at the battleground, he steps forward and throws a powerful spear from where he is. The spear is strong enough to break through Prax's defenses and impale her to the wall. After immobilizing Prax, Zetsu calls off the battle for the day, telling his army that they are going to resume the next day. On the ship, Shu berates Arrow for not killing Kai because it might ruin their plans, but Arrow reminds Shu that Kai is his childhood friend, and if he kills him, it will only haunt him in the future. At Rekka's first aid tent, Kai screams out in pain when he realizes that he just failed yet again. Up next, Shu tells Atli and Arrow about everything that he has learned concerning warpers so far. He wants them to fight smart because they will soon clash with Rekka's army. They plan to come from behind and attack the enemy in an obvious pincer move. While all of this is going on, the citizens of Luther begin to protest against the war. They are scared that they are going to lose the war and then die after. To quell this unrest, Fine has no choice but to address the people and assure them that Luther is not going to lose Tereka. The princess lets them know that Luther has the advantage, and after hearing what the princess has to say, the citizens go back to their daily activities. At Rekka's camp, Ren is putting her all into training. She wants to become the best version of herself, so that the next time she fights Arrow, she will come out on top. While she is in training, Zetsu shows up, and because of Ren's claims to take Shu down, the Emperor decides to test her. He binds her and throws her into the water, leaving her to make her own choices. Ren is so determined not to die until she kills Shu. She manages to grab a tree vine with her teeth to prevent her from swimming away. Kai also hears some soldiers walk by his recovery room, talking about how weak he is for losing to the ship's crew. This gets him really mad, and he stands up from his sickbed, looking all angry and motivated. Later on, Shu tricks Bit into being the ship's target master. Bit will be in charge of shooting the cannons because Shu believes in his accuracy. The following day, the battle continues, and not long after, the ship runs into Kai yet again. However, Kai is still not strong enough to fight, and he ends up getting trashed by the crew yet again. Atli, Elsha, and Arrow beat him around like he is trash, while Bit shoots him down with the cannon to finish the job and get Kai off their freaking-
rocks. The ship continues its advance while they leave the other Luther soldiers to keep Kai busy. At the forefront, Prax starts losing concentration because she is apparently scared that Zetsu is going to hit her just like he did the day before. The trauma from yesterday is still reeking through her body, but she is trying her best to fight it off. With the ship coming on from behind the Rekka army, this doesn't go unnoticed as Zetsu tells his men that the ship is close to them. Not long after this, Ren presents herself to the Emperor, and this is after she has fought tooth and nail, just so she can survive. The Emperor is proud of her, and he gives her a warper so he can see what the reborn lady can do. Ren makes her way to where Kai is facing a bunch of Luther soldiers. He is about to be overpowered when Ren arrives to take them out. Ren saves Kai from an imminent death, and this is when Kai realizes that Ren has changed. It turns out that Ren's suit also has wings now. Ren wants to take Kai with her, but he refuses. Kai believes that he should be left behind since he now sees himself as nothing but a burden. The once invincible general is getting beat up by a bunch of peasants, Kai thinks. However, Ren being the stubborn person that she is, continues to fill Kai's head with motivational talks about how he is not supposed to give up. After saying everything she can, Kai regains his spirit to fight. Ren then morphs with Kai, turning them into one giant monstrosity. Ren now serves as Kai's wings, giving him the ability to reach places he couldn't before. At the forefront of the battle, Prax is about to lose her life when the ship shows up just in time. The ship's cannon fire saves Prax and knocks her opponent out of the way. Bit is getting better with every shot that he takes with the cannon. Things get complicated when Kai shows up on the scene. He now has wings all thanks to Ren, which means Arrow has no choice but to engage Kai. Kai goes crazy with his new motivation and starts knocking everything out of place. Even Arrow gets thrown out of the way when he tries to stop Kai. Elsha and the ship also get hit by Kai's immense power. Kai turns to Shu and tells him that he is going to kill Arrow so Shu can finally come back to his senses. He blames Arrow for everything that has happened to Shu so far. Since Kai has gotten stronger now, Arrow believes that there is no reason for him to also hold back, which means the two are about to get into an intense and fierce battle. While Arrow is battling it out with Kai and Ren, Atli and the others are getting trashed by Rekka's generals. Prax soon shows up to support Arrow while other Luther generals also appear to help Atli and Elsha. Prax and Arrow come up with the idea of leading Kai and Ren into the sky's defensive system. Kai and Ren get hit by the defense system, but as usual, Kai easily breaks through. In no time, they have Prax and Arrow on the run again. As the battle proceeds, Rekka gets the upper hand with Luther suffering lots of casualties. To make things worse, the battle starts to project over Luther for all the citizens to watch. The person behind this is unknown, but it is definitely going to be a mood killer for Luther citizens to see their access being handed over to them by Rekka. The elect supreme, Rudolf then shows his face, telling Fine that he is responsible for projecting the war video. He claims he is showing the citizens what is going on on the battlefield to let them know what it means to be at war. For Rudolf, he claims to be entertaining the citizens, since war is the best form of entertainment entertainment that is available. At this point, Luther ministers realize that they need to put up a good fight before their citizens start to lose faith in them. Just then, a warper rolls up to Fine, and a not-so-terrible idea comes to her head. The fight between Arrow and Kai now has Kai get the upper hand. Kai and Ren beat Prax and Arrow around the battlefield like they are in training. Tensions are high and those in Luther are seriously worried. It now seems Luther and Rekka are at a stalemate while on the front lines. Fine picks up the warper and decides that she is going to the battlefield to help her people. The ministers are worried that Fine's alter ego is going to take over, but she assures them that she can keep her in place. Arrow leads Kai to the sky again, trying to explain to him that they are all trapped in this world. Arrow lets him know that the wall was put in place by someone, and Arrow tries his best to lay it out, that Shu is just trying his best to know what is beyond the wall. Even after all the explanations, Kai is not ready to listen. Kai goes after Arrow and knocks him to the ground, ready to eliminate him so that Shu can finally let go of all the supposed stupid notions that are filling up his mind. Kai beats Arrow up like he is nothing, and even Shu is now worried. He remains mute while he desperately tries to find a solution to the problem. Arrow has his back on the ground as Kai picks up his giant sword to end him. Just then, the sky opens and Fine emerges from there. Fine gently lands in between Kai and Arrow. Fine is radiating in the color of love which is pink, and she is ready to take on Kai. The enemy aims at Fine and tries to shoot her down, but she simply absorbs everything without taking a single damage. Fine understands everyone's pain, and she tells Kai that she has only one job, and this is to protect her citizens. Fine releases rays of love from her body, and immediately, all of her comrades who are wounded get healed up. Kai tries going after her, but Arrow is now back to his optimal state, and he is able to easily defend the princess. Everyone is wowed by the princess's abilities, and those watching back home have their faith restored. The moment Zetsu notices that Fine is on the battlefield, and she is lifting the morale of her soldiers, Zetsu decides that it is time for him to also go to the front lines. To manifest his armor, Zetsu has to wear at least 10 warpers just to contain his conviction. Zetsu transforms into his armor and shows himself on the battlefield. Fear grips everyone when this happens, but it even becomes 
worse when Zetsu spreads his hands to release a burst of energy that disintegrates mountains. Just one action on the battlefield, and Zetsu almost wipes out his enemies. This shows everyone just how strong the ruler of Rekka is. Once the dust settles, Zetsu is standing right in front of Fine. Zetsu has been waiting to fight Fine for ages, and he now has the perfect opportunity to do so. Arrow and Prax try to intervene, but Zetsu just throws them away like they are nothing. Zetsu goes after Fine and starts hitting her with powerful blasts just to try and push out her alternate ego. Zetsu manages to succeed with this, and the real person he wants to fight shows herself to Zetsu. Zetsu wants the crazy part of Fine, and he just got his wishes. Now that Fine has transformed into her evil side, Zetsu is about to enjoy himself even further. However, things are not going so well back in Luther because the citizens are horrified when they see Fine's other personality. Fine goes after Zetsu and knocks him down, but this does nothing to the old man, as he is prepared to have all the fun he can have. Even Fine's alter ego feels some bit of fear from the old man. While Fine is propelled by love, her alter ego is powered by the opposite. The fight becomes more intense, and the army is forced to come to Fine's support. However, Fine goes crazy, and she releases a blast of energy from her body to consume her enemies and even her own people. She sucks out the energy from them just to power herself. All of these atrocities are being watched back in Luther, and the people only see Fine as a terrible and horrible person. Rudolph sits in his palace and smiles as he watches Fine display her madness to everyone who is watching. Trying to get the princess back to her usual self, Arrow has his clones block Zetsu's view, while he hits Fine with a powerful blast from his armor. Just then, Rudolph cuts off the video feed, because he has already shown the people what he wants them to see. On the battlefield, Arrow's blast power is enough to return Fine to her normal loving self, but the damage has been done already. Fine is about to have another showdown with Zetsu, and it seems she is able to control her alter ego this time. Zetsu hits Fine pretty hard, but she manages to absorb the damage. The Granager is also back in action after being grounded by war damage. Shu tells all of his comrades to immediately fall back to the ship because he has a brilliant plan. Even the princess retreats back to the ship. Arrow channels his energy into the ship, and so does Fine. The ship prepares to fire its cannon, but Zetsu is not worried. He is confident that the ship doesn't have what it takes to bring him down. However, Zetsu realizes that he might actually be wrong when the ship opens a big hidden cannon located below the ship. With the energy from Arrow and Fine, they release a burst of energy that destroys the enemy's warpers. The only suit of armor standing after this is Zetsu himself. Being the influential leader that he is, Zetsu still orders his men to fight even though they have no armor. The soldiers pick up their swords and charge toward the ship, even though it means ultimate death for them. There is no way they can win against Bryheights, but these bunch of soldiers do not seem to care. Shu understands the way of the Rekka life. He knows they would rather die as long as they are dying for their pride. Arrow holds back when it comes to attacking the enemy soldiers. Shu wants to wipe them out, but Bit stops him. Shu has already fired a round of cannon fire before Bit stops him. Fine cannot but wonder what is going on in the enemy's heeds as they charge toward their certain death. Fine cannot sit around even though they are enemies. She is a preacher of love after all, and using her loving powers, she releases healing energies to help the wounded enemy or friends alike. Even with this level of compassion, Zetsu doesn't seem to care as he still orders his men to continue with the attack. Fine is determined to show everyone that her love radiates above everything else. Fine pushes herself to the limit to unleash a burst of love energy that falls on Zetsu and his men. Surprisingly, Zetsu is healed from Fine's influence. His armor breaks apart, and the moment this happens, Zetsu accepts defeat. He tells his men to give up on the fight because Fine and Luther have won. Once everything settles down, Fine and Zetsu shake hands so as not to attack each other again. Zetsu and his men then pack their things and leave Luther. Fine addresses her soldiers, telling them to prepare for a better future. Prax grabs Fine, and they head back home. Fine wants to use her victory against Zetsu as a pacifying point for the already angry citizens. However, Fine returns home to meet rejection from her people, who now see her as nothing but a vile creature. They even throw trash and stones at Fine, forcing Prax to get her out of there before things get even worse. On the other hand, Atli is moody because she didn't do much during the battle, but Elsha points out everything nice and awesome that she did without even realizing it. To even make things worse, the citizens of Luther now have warpers, and when Fine asks the scientist how they got their hands on the warpers, he claims that the lab was robbed, leading to all their warpers getting stolen. Fine and the minister sit down for a meeting, and this is when Rudolph reveals that he is responsible for everything that is happening. Fine wants another chance to talk to the citizens, but she passes out before she even gets the opportunity to leave the room. Prax takes her to a room where she finds out that Fine actually suffered a bit of damage during the battle. On the other hand, the battleship still remains on the battlefield, because Shu needs to fix some things on the ship, and this is going to take him more than a day to actually complete it. Shu believes that Rekka is still going to attack at some point. Just then, an unidentified weapon attacks the ship. Arrow flies out to 
to engage the enemy but finds it hard to subdue the enemy. Shu tries to figure out who is attacking them, but a magnetic interference blocks everything he tries to do. After hitting the ship a few times, the unidentified enemy flies off. Shortly afterward, the princess wakes up, and she decides to face her citizens again. Fine stands in front of her people to try and talk to them. The people have a person to represent them, but before any negotiation can even take place, Arrow shows up and steps on the representative instantly killing him. Before they can figure out what is happening, Arrow disappears from the scene. It turns out that the Arrow that actually attacked was not the real Arrow. The attacker is the clown lady working for Rudolph. Everything happening so far and still happening seems to be Rudolph's call. This just made things worse because the citizens now want Fine and the entirety of the Edger village dead. Not long after this, Rudolph transforms into his presentable form and presents himself to the people. Since he is the supreme elect, he tells the people that Fine is no longer fit to rule. He revokes Fine's status and tells the people that they are free to do whatever they want with Fine. The angry mob tries coming after Fine but the guards hold them back. Fine is still telling the guards not to harm anyone when they get overrun by the mob. Prax immediately jumps into action, ready to take out whoever is brave enough to touch Fine. However, things turn to absolute shit when the ministers show up to tell the people that they are in support of whatever Rudolph is doing. In fact, the ministers want Fine to be executed. Prax is not ready to have this, and just as she is about to get Fine out of there, the clown shows up and knocks her to the ground. The clown also has her own special armored suit, which looks absolutely terrifying. Sola runs to where Rudolph is to try and stop him from whatever shit he is pulling with Fine in the country. When Sola asks Rudolph why he is acting as a villain, Rudolph replies that the divine being doesn't want peace. In a turn of events, Rudolph has been pulling the strings from the start. He was even the one who made Prax and Fine look like a bird, causing Sola to shoot them down from the sky. Sola gets angry when he hears this, and he transforms into his suit of armor. Sola tries to take on Rudolph, but he is nowhere near Rudolph's level, and he is forced to run away. On the other hand, Fine is about to be executed by the guards when the real Arrow shows up to get her out of there. Even though Fine wants to stay back to talk to her citizens, Arrow refuses because he knows that it is of no use. The clown tries to follow Arrow but Prax intercepts her. Sola makes his way to where the Edger villagers are holed up to try and rescue them before the guards get to them. While Sola is rescuing the villagers, he is attacked by the military. Even with a big pole hanging off his back, he manages to save the villagers. However, several more poles are thrown into him to knock him down. Arrow and the princess show up to get rid of the attackers. It is too late for Sola already since he is severely injured. Sola dies right in front of the princess, and with this, Fine just lost someone precious to her. Sola's death also means Prax is about to be thrown into a state of grief. The military shows up on the scene, but the Granager is also present. The ministers demanded that Arrow hand over Fine, but at that moment, Atlee declares that the village is no longer any nation which makes it an independent nation. The new nation is known as Granager United, and Fine is under their protection. Atli lets the ministers know that any form of violence against them will be treated equally. Once Atli makes this declaration, Rudolph pulls his people back, telling them to let Fine go. Upon returning to the ship, Atli is crowned the queen of the new nation. Rudolph only allowed them to leave because he wanted more nations because more nations meant more wars. Everything is going pretty well in the new nation, and they now grow their own crops on the ship. Invitations are sent out for the nation's signing day, which is going to take place on the ship. Arrow and Shu will not be present for the ceremony, because they have businesses to attend to in Rekka. Nation leaders and their representatives soon start to arrive at the ship for signing. Fine still remains an important person, because she is now a counselor for Granager United. All the nations present are to come without weapons or their military, because it is obviously a diplomatic gathering. However, the president of Iki secretly comes on the ship with a weapon. Luther's minister Peeth is shocked when he finds out that the entire armored division serving under Prax has defected to Grand Edger United. Peeth is pained to see this, but there is nothing he can do, because his actions against Fine can also be considered treason. All the nations both small and mighty are present on the ship. Even the pretty boys are now an independent nation, and they are present for the ceremony. Present on the ship is a strange guy hiding under a hood. Now in Rekka, Arrow and Shu arrive in the nation while the generals are having a training session. Kai is holed up in the royal library, looking into the secret notes, and he seems to have seen a piece of important information. Ren is not happy to see Shu and Arrow. Her first instinct is to attack Shu, but Kyo tells her to back off. Shu is there on a diplomatic mission, and attacking him simply spells war. When Shu asks after Tai, he learns that the man has run away from the country. He has packed all of his fortune and escaped to Luther to work for Rudolph. Shu sits down to make a deal with Kyo. Shu wants Rekka to give Granager a certain part of Rekka's land. In exchange for this, Granager will not be attacking Rekka. This sounds like a very outrageous deal, forcing Ren to attack Shu from behind. She holds Shu at gunpoint, but Shu doesn't look scared a bit. Kyo figures out that Shu is not scared because he has another card up his sleeve. It turns Turns out that Shu still has bombs in the city and he can easily press the trigger. Once he reveals his trump card, Ren has no 
choice but to slip up, giving Arrow the chance to go after her. On the ship, Fine tells the present country leaders that Granager is aiming to build a new Lingaland, but everyone's help is needed if this is going to be achieved. All Zetsu cares about is Fine's strength, and he even suggests that she comes to Rekka so that he can measure her strength. Fine simply replies that she is not interested in any other nation or country because Granager is now her home. Now in Rekka, Kai finally shows his face, and he has some questions to ask Shu. He wants to know why Shu will risk his life to return to Rekka when he knows how dangerous it is. Shu also wants Rekka's land, which is up north, but Kai knows this is for a good reason. Kai already found the notes, but it is not complete because Kai has broken off the most important parts. Kai then asks Shu to come clean and tell him what he really wants with the land. Shu is not ready to say, and Kai tells Shu that Zetsu can easily destroy the battleship if he wants to. All Zetsu needs to attack the ship is a reason, and Kyo is ready to give Zetsu the reason that he needs. Kyo gives Ren a knife to kill him so that they can pin the crime on Shu, which is enough reason for Zetsu to attack the battleship. All Kai wants is the truth, and the moment Shu realizes that he has no way out, he decides to come clean. Shu reveals that another battleship like Granager lies under the ground in the north. Just then, the country is attacked by a flying warship, confirming that Shu is not lying. This warship is being operated by the defector Tai. As usual, Rudolph is also behind this, and this is just another one of his games. The news of the attack has reached Zetsu and everyone else on Granager. Bit and Elsha run into the strange hooded guy, who tells them that the ship has been invited to come beyond the wall. He is affiliated to a group called the Lin Faith, and the founder wants the ship beyond the wall. Zetsu immediately leaves to defend his country, and possibly unalive Tai, who has been a thorn in his flesh. Tai's attack on Rekka just ruined the signing ceremony. Arrow tries attacking the flying battleship, but he is basically powerless against it. Arrow is informed about the strange guy talking about the wall, and he is forced to retreat back to Granager. Tay continues to attack the soldiers, and he demands that the nation swear loyalty to him, because he has conquered them. Arrow arrives at Granager, and the messenger tells him that the founder has requested that the ship come to Epitaph Mountain. When asked how the ship is to cross the wall, the messenger assures them that they are going to be invited. Arrow is also going to find out who he really is when he gets beyond the wall. Arrow gets serious about his identity issue, and he grabs the messenger but the guy just turns into dust. Basically, the messenger is not a real person, but particles put together to pass a message. Tai is still wreaking havoc on Rekka when Zetsu shows up. Tai tries to stop him by firing his biggest weapon, but when the dust settles, Zetsu is standing strong on his suit of armor. It turns out that he collected the bind warper that Iki's ruler has with him. Tei realizes that he is in trouble when Zetsu draws his energized bow and fires a powerful blast from it. This powerful arrow dashes toward the ship and cuts Tai in half, leaving the ship intact. But Zetsu finds a bunch of warpers on the ship. This just puts Rekka into the position of world power again. They have a bulk load of warpers, and they also have a flying warship at their disposal. Arrow knows that Rudolph would have pointed Tai in the right direction where he can find the ship. Things get more interesting when another ship emerges from under Luther. Everything happening has been planned out by Rudolph, and everyone else is just a pawn in his grand game. Granager soon receives a message from Rudolph, telling them that he is responsible for the emergence of the two new warships. He wants to see how Granager is going to survive against the two attack ships coming for them. To know Rudolph's gameplay, Arrow agrees that they honor the Founder's invitation and go beyond the wall. Since Rekka and Ludo can't even touch them beyond the wall, it is a bonus for them. Once everyone is in agreement, they begin their journey to the wall. Three days later, they are almost at the wall but Luther's battleship is right behind them. Luther's battleship is intimidating, and they even got the annoying choir singing just to put fear in Granager. Luther's ship wastes no time in firing a shot at Granager, but they narrowly miss. However, the next shot is a direct hit, but nothing really serious happens to Granager. Luther then deploys its military to go after Granager. Peeth is throwing everything into the battle to make sure Arrow and his people do not make it to the wall. To keep the flying soldiers away, Prax flies to engage them. Prax is more than effective as she easily decimates the enemies. Unknown to Peeth, Shu has a card up his sleeve. Luther's ship is baited into coming real close. Just when Luther's ship is in firing range, the Granager does something absolutely unexpected. It changes posture and stands tall like a transformer. Once it is in a vertical position, the ship taps into Arrow's energy and fires a powerful blast that takes down the entire military force. Even those on the ship lose their warpers, and the ship comes crashing down. They manage to get Luther off their back, and the next thing is to go beyond the wall. The messenger shows up again and tells them to head directly for the wall. Trusting the guy, the ship heads for the wall, and just when they are about to hit the wall, the wall gives way, allowing them to pass through. As they pass through another layer of wall to get to Epitaph Mountain, the ship is worried that Luther will come after them, but the messenger assures them that only those who are invited by the founder can go through the wall. However, Rudolph has told Peeth and his men that they can actually go through the wall, because it is fake. 
Graniger soon arrives at Epitaph Mountain where faces are hung on poles. These are the faces of those who died in Lingaland. Sola's face is among these faces, but when Prax rushes out of the ship to check out his brother's face, the Founder shows up and tells her not to touch anything. This is basically a mountain of the dead, and the Founder tells Arrow that he is a lost child from beyond the wall. To help Arrow understand who he is, the Founder hits him with a blast of energy. It turns out that Arrow actually had a mission to fulfill, but he forgot about it when he lost his memory. Just then, Luther's ship shows up and starts attacking Graniger. Arrow is no longer himself as he dashes toward Luther's battleship. Arrow goes crazy as he easily cuts through everything that the Luther battleship throws at him. He makes it to the ship, but Peeth is rest assured that Arrow won't hurt them because his attacks don't kill humans. However, they turn out to be wrong as Arrow fires off a powerful golden blast from his body to wipe out everyone aboard. None of the personnel aboard the ship is left alive, and this is a shock to everyone watching. Even Arrow somewhat comes to his senses and he screams out in pain. Arrow tries to fight whatever spell is affecting him, but he finds it difficult to do. Just then, Rudolph and his assistant, the clown, show up. Rudolph explains that the arrow they are looking at is the real arrow. Apparently Arrow was sent by the divine to wipe out Lingaland. It is a surprise that Rudolph already knows all of these, and has been the one pulling the strings just to mess with everyone else. Rudolph explains to the crew that he was chosen by the divine being to correct whatever mistake that is going on in Lingaland. Rudolph is no human because he is basically working for the divine it turns out that all the battleships hidden in Lingaland were actually put there for Arrow to use. He is considered the destroyer of worlds, but Arrow doesn't want this title. He tries hard to break free of whatever is controlling him so he won't have to take down the Grand Edger. He then begs the ship's crew to shoot him down so he won't do something he is going to regret. Atli tries reasoning with him, telling him that he can actually fight whatever is controlling him. Arrow doesn't think he has a chance this time around, because as long as the ship is functional, his power will continue to grow. The crew turns to the super genius Shu, asking what can be done. Shu then comes up with the idea of shooting the Luther battleship, with the hope that it is going to stop Arrow. Arrow puts himself in the perfect position to be targeted by the cannons. Atli and Prax engage the clown to make sure that she doesn't interfere in their attempt to return Arrow to his normal self. The ship manages to pull this off by hitting Arrow pretty badly with their cannons. Once the dust settles, Arrow flies away from the scene. The ship tries to return to the mountain but gets trapped by a layer of walls. They start looking around the ship for anything that can help them. They stumble upon the pod that brought Arrow. Shu immediately becomes excited because he knows he has found something that can actually help them. While the crew is stuck in a boxed wall, Arrow is walking about, outside the wall, trying to find a way to remove his warper and get out of the armor. The warper controls him, not giving him a choice whenever he sees an enemy. Shu has been able to acquire a warper from Arrow's pod, and he is working with this. They are confident that they are going to escape because Rudolph would not not have boxed them in if there was no chance of escaping. Zetsu is trying to find Arrow when Rudolph shows up to inform him that he can help find Arrow. He wants to tell Zetsu where Arrow is so he can go after him. Basically, Zetsu is considered a cheat and shouldn't exist. The divine being has considered him too powerful, and because of this, Arrow was sent to destroy him. Zetsu has gotten too strong and cannot be overlooked again. Zetsu hears this and only fuels his ego. He begs Rudolph to tell him where Arrow is so he can fight and see whether their so-called destroyer will be able to kill him. When it is time to find Arrow, Zetsu hands over the controls of the Rekka ship to Kyo. Now on Grenadier, the old grandpa finally tells Atli and Elsha that they are in support of whatever they want to do. They have come to the realization that the ship is their home, and no place will replace the ship. On the other hand, Arrow runs into some kids, and the suit tries to kill them, but Arrow directs the blast to himself. However, it turns out that his own blast cannot even kill him. Not long after this, Shu is able to use the warper that he found to break through the wall so the ship can escape through. Arrow flies into the sky to try and escape via the sky. The air defense system proves too powerful, and he fails to break through. Just then, a Rakuho portal opens up, and Arrow uses this to access the other side which is basically space. Before he gets to do anything else, Rudolph shows up and drags him back. He smashes him to the ground, causing a loud explosion. This is visible to both ships that are after him. Granager contacts Zetsu, telling him to back off a bit and let them handle Arrow. Shu tells Zetsu that he needs to bring Arrow back to his senses. It is evident that Arrow is Rudolph's puppet, but Shu is trying to change that. Shu is able to sweet-talk Zetsu into agreeing to allow him to fight Arrow. However, Zetsu lets him know that he is going to release his full power and crush Granager if they manage to defeat Arrow. Once they are on the same page, the ship goes after Arrow. They plan to use Fine's love energy to hit Arrow and break him free from whatever hold Rudolph has on him. The ship uses its big cannon to hit Arrow, but this doesn't freaking work on him. Fine then decides to personally engage the guy. Arrow tries to eliminate her, but it doesn't work. Fine's alter ego takes over and she hugs Arrow pretty tightly, using her energy to consume whatever bad thing Arrow has living in him. She is able to do this, but at the expense of her life. By the time she is done, 
Fine's alter ego disappears. Arrow finally loses the evil suit, leaving him to pant like a dog. Everyone is relieved to see him back to normal, but things go sideways again when Shu approaches him. Shu shakes Arrow only to vanish from whatever power resides inside of Arrow. The clown shows up, telling Arrow that the suit might be gone, but the power remains inside of him. No matter who he touches, he is going to end up killing them. Arrow screams out as he watches Shu turn to dust right in front of him. The clown is basically built to frustrate Arrow's existence. She latches another warper onto Arrow's hand, forcing him to manifest the suit again. Arrow goes after the clown but doesn't leave a dent. However, the clown has finally managed to anger everyone close to Shu and Arrow. Kai manifests his armor and comes after the annoying Kai and Ren combine to beat up the clown for killing their friend. Shu and Kai might have gone their separate ways, but their love for each did not die. Kai and Ren are able to take down the clown, and Kai uses the opportunity to raise Rekka's flag to show everyone how dominant they are going to become. Now on Granager, they are trying to hold on to each other, now that Shu is gone. Shu is the genius who figures everything out, but he is gone now. Not long after this, Prax takes two of her men and heads to Luther to find Rudolph. Rudolph doesn't seem scared or moved by whatever threat Prax is spewing. Rudolph even manages to get Prax mad by telling him everything that he did to Fine and Sola. Prax gets really mad and goes after Rudolph, but all Rudolph does is push Prax away with his finger. Rudolph is basically like a mini divine with the way he handles both Prax and her men. He beats them around so effortlessly and could have terminated them. However, he is only toying around with them to make them suffer. Rudolph is about to unalive Prax when Arrow shows up on the scene to save her. Arrow demands that Rudolph bring everyone back and also return him to his normal self. Arrow threatens to use the destructive beam on Rudolph if he doesn't do as said. This is quite interesting to Rudolph because he wants to see if Arrow's death beam can really end him. However, Arrow finds out that he cannot attack the man because he basically works for him and Rudolph works for the divine. Just then, Zetsu joins the party. He hits Rudolph with a powerful blast that destroys everything around him except Rudolph himself. Zetsu also has all of his generals ready to fight Rudolph. Rudolph directs Arrow toward the bunch to try and wipe them out, but Zetsu is overpowered. He is able to block Arrow's destructive beam and even hit the guy. Zetsu tries to hit Rudolph with his blasts, but Rudolph blocks them. Zetsu and Arrow end up facing each other and Zetsu threatens to kill Arrow if he doesn't stop protecting Rudolph. Arrow gladly welcomes death telling Zetsu that he is free to kill him so that he is going to stop being a threat. Arrow knows Zetsu is powerful enough to do this, and this is the reason he is begging him. Zetsu calls Arrow a hopeless person who gave up because Shu is gone. Zetsu then shows the boy just how overpowered he is when he grabs him. Zetsu is able to absorb all of the destructive beams that are holed up inside of Arrow. Even Rudolph is shocked to see this, and this just proves the more reason they need to terminate Zetsu. Arrow transforms into his sword version so Zetsu can wield him and probably get the chance to unalive Rudolph. Zetsu's body is disintegrating every second, but he is powerful enough to rebuild his body. Once Rudolph sees how powerful Zetsu has become, he decides to get serious too. Rudolph uses a warp to manifest his armor, and he even connects it with a bigger one, making him look like a freaking Megazord. Rudolph is ready to do Arrow's job for him since he failed at it. Rudolph starts unleashing his powerful blasts to wipe out anything it touches. Even Zetsu's generals are gripped by fear, because they have never come across a more dangerous opponent. Things are not going too well until Fine shows up and uses her power to heal everyone who has been hit by Rudolph's blasts. Even Rudolph is frustrated at this point, and he starts wondering why Fine is going against the Divine's wishes. Zetsu and Arrow then tell everyone to back off so that they can fight Rudolph. However, they all get caught up in a storm. Just then, Bit stands above the Granager, telling them that he has a warper that has been built by Shu. This is a warper that contains power from the three nations, and Bit is confident that it is going to work. Bit manifests the warper which turns out to be a giant warper. Bit then combines the warper with Granager, giving it a power boost that breaks through the storm that Rudolph created. Shu had previously talked to Bit about this. Shu knows that Bit's conviction is pretty strong which makes him the best for the job. Bit's conviction helps him to rely on everyone, and with this, he is able to help Granager become more powerful. Rudolph can feel the new boost of power as he gets beat up. Zetsu continues wielding Arrow in an attempt to break Rudolph's defenses. Rudolph soon breaks away from the major suit to give himself more freedom. Arrow figures out that the cables attached to Rudolph feed him his power, which is why they need to sever them. Everyone gathers around to go after him all at once, but even with this, Rudolph remains strong. Anytime the group gets hurt, Fine heals them with her love power. Rudolph doesn't think Finn can actually keep this up because he is human after all. The fight becomes more interesting when Zetsu and Arrow take on Rudolph head on. As the battle continues, Bit comes up with the idea that the Grand Edger combine with Rekka's warship. Thanks to his manifest armor, they are able to achieve this. The newly combined ship is now called Gran Rekka. It turns out that Shu already planned this ahead, which shows his ingenuity. Zetsu is now using too much power to go after Rudolph, but he doesn't mind. 
mind. Zetsu is ready to disappear as long as he takes Rudolph with him. In the process of this, Zetsu has even used his power to wear off his old face, giving rise to a younger version of the guy. Zetsu fires a powerful arrow into Rudolph, thinking it is over, but Rudolph pulls the Uno reverse on them. He grabs onto the arrow in an attempt to make Arrow remember who he truly is. Just then, the clown also shows up when the team asks her how she managed to pull it off. She lets them know that Rudolph is practically immortal, which means she is one too. She works for Rudolph and as long as Rudolph still lives, she is going nowhere. Rudolph manages to get to Zetsu and hits him with the disintegration beam. As Zetsu slowly loses his grip on life, he does something quite amazing. Zetsu uses the last of his strength to get to Rudolph and pushes his hand into his chest. He pulls a vast amount of Rudolph's power and will, which immediately breaks down the wall he created around them. Zetsu gives the people a bit of motivational talk as he finally vanishes. Kai and the other generals weep for their dead general, but at least, he helped to get rid of Rudolph. After the explosion and the dust settles, there is no sign of the clown, Rudolph, and Arrow. The group starts to wonder if the trio all died in the explosion or managed to escape. They decide to hold a funeral for Zetsu in the future. However, they want to find the missing trio to make sure they are not being played. Not long after this, they receive a report that Arrow is alive and he is destroying things. To get to where Arrow is pretty fast, the two battleships have no choice but to combine again. Arrow no longer has control over himself, and he has already given up because he believes there is no longer one alive to save him or even stop him. Just then, Kai shows up, telling Arrow that he is there to stop him. Arrow believes that is of no use because even Shu and Zetsu tried their best, but it all ended up in failure. Kai is prepared to take down Arrow as per Zetsu's last wishes. Kai then hits Arrow with the dark conviction particles that he finds pretty hard to erase. Kai is basically following Zetsu's path. Once Arrow finds out that the particles are actually working, he decides to give in and let the particles do their work because he is tired of living already. Just when Kai is about to finish the job, someone unexpectedly shows up from above. The surprise visitor turns out to be Shu, whom everyone presumes to be dead. He stops Kai's attack and he stands in between Kai and Arrow, because Kai always has a trump card up his sleeve. Shu even looks bigger than before, and with just one act, he resets whatever is happening to Arrow. He hits Arrow with a particle that resets his data and wipes out the destructive side of him. Kai doesn't want to believe that the person standing in front of him is Shu, but Bit tells him to calm down. Bit assures him that the person he is looking at is actually Shu, and this is because he managed to pull off the perfect warper that he has been working on. It turns out that Shu and Bit were the only ones who knew about the plan. Shu only made Arrow wipe out his Bryheit so he could get to look deeper into the world and how it works. Shu kept his body in a cryo chamber and told Bit to look after him while he was gone. Shu knew that the shit has to work because the world is a goner if it doesn't. Once Arrow is back to his normal self, Kai demands that Granager hand him over so that they can punish or probably execute him because he caused Zetsu's death. Just then, the leader of the pretty boys, Bru shows up with his comrades. He points out that both Rekka and Granager are in his domain which means they are actually trespassing. Since the case is like this, Bru wants Arrow's jurisdiction. Since the pretty boys actually own the territory, Shu suggests that they follow the law. Because of this, Arrow is allowed to actually walk free on the ship, while they all sit down for a conversation. Shu tries explaining to Kai that the wall was created by the divine and they are not the only ones. There are other worlds like them, and they all exist to sustain the divine. Basically, the divine survives on the conviction released by humans. Even the dead are gathered in one place so that their convictions can be harvested. To put it simply, they are livestock that are being bred to feed a single entity. The pretty boys cannot believe that they just fought off the idea of being livestock, only to find themselves in a grand version of it. Shu continues to explain that they are going to need access to the Holy Land, but he still doesn't know how to get there. Just then, Arrow reveals that he has been able to get to outer space by going through a Rakuho hole. Once he mentions this, Shu realizes that they can also get it done if Arrow has done it before. They plan to head to Epitaph Mountain where the convictions are being sent out. They are confident that they are going to have access to the Rakuho holes once they are on the mountain. This is the first time the nations will be coming together for an alliance. Their aim is to reach the divine and since they are all going to benefit from it, they have no choice but to come together. Arrow is still worried about the fact that he lost his memories. He wants to know why he is adamant about going beyond the wall. Arrow is feeling the guilt of everyone that he killed, and the moment Kai sees this, Kai scolds him. They need Arrow, but he sees him as pretty useless as of the moment. To retrieve the Arrow that they actually need, Kai decides to beat some sense into him. Kai then challenges Arrow to a fight, and Arrow gladly accepts. They step outside to fight, but Arrow doesn't have a sword with him. Kai charges toward him with his giant sword, but Arrow is able to dodge the attacks. As the battle continues, Arrow finally realizes why he is actually fighting. He comes to his senses and realizes that he is still alive because of the people he cares about. Kai changes the weapon to Zetsu's terrifying light weapon, 
He tries hitting Arrow with this, but at that moment, Arrow realizes himself, and this gives him the strength to grab the sword with his bare hands. Arrow boldly tells everyone that he is no longer the Destroyer, but he has now achieved the status of a savior. Even if he was sent to destroy the world, Arrow has evolved past his task, and he now wants to save it. With Kai's help, Arrow is able to realize who he really is, and put everything that has happened behind him. Atli and the others are happy to finally have Arrow back. Everyone celebrates with him, but at this moment, Shu sees right through Kai, and realizes that he is a good person with just a stubborn heart. When it is time for the ship to leave for their expenditure to find the divine, the civilians are left with the pretty boys. Only essential personnel and those with combat experience are cleared to leave. Before they leave, Shu has a heart-to-heart -heart conversation with Kai. During the conversation, Kai figures out that Shu is hiding his scar to make it seem like he doesn't care. The two finally get to put their differences aside and look forward to the great future that they have always wanted. The two ships combine and proceed beyond the wall. They get easy access to the wall because there is really no need to block them out since they now know the truth. When they get to the poles covered with human faces, they observe a minute of silence for the dead. Just as they are about to reach the mountain, it comes crashing down. Surprisingly, Rudolph emerges from behind the mountain, letting them know that the mountain is no longer needed, and the fact that he is basically an immortal. Rudolph is not there to play around, and he is ready to wipe out Lingaland. Rudolph opens a Rakuho portal that releases drilling machines into the ground. To further destroy their hopes of winning, Rudolph transforms the entire pole of faces into a giant sword. Rudolph weaponizes the dead's emotions just to take down the ship. He uses the giant sword to hold down the ship, making it impossible for them to move or leave the position that they are locked in. Arrow calls Rudolph a shithead for using the dead, but Rudolph also reminds him that he has killed a ton of people. In a twist of events again, the clown is also alive all thanks to her boss. Kai and his men try destroying the drilling machine but the clown is there to fight them. Arrow and the ship are still pinned down by Rudolph's sword. To break free of the sword, Arrow asks for forgiveness from those he has killed, and with this, he is able to push himself forward. Arrow's determination helps him to restore the poles and the faces on them, thus breaking free from Rudolph's grip. Rudolph is shocked to see this, and he wonders why they just would not give up. They are able to push out of the zone and head back to the outer world to help with the drilling machine. They arrive at the fight scene where the clown is just messing with everyone else. The ship tries to stop the spinning but the ship is just thrown aside. Rudolph also shows up to make things difficult for them. However, Shu sees this as a piece of good news, because Rudolph Rudolph wouldn't have come to attack them if they didn't have a chance to stop the drilling machine. This is a confidence boost for them, and Shu tells Arrow to work with Kai. Arrow changes into the sword so that Kai can wield him. With this sword, Kai is able to go after Rudolph and inflict damage continuously. All those who are wounded are healed by Fine's love power. Kai then uses Zetsu's ultimate skill which allows him to fire a powerful arrow. With this skill, Kai is able to combine his power, Ren's power, and Arrow's power to take out the drilling machine. However, Rudolph opens another portal, ready to release release another machine. It turns out that the world-killing machine will just continue to respawn no matter how many that they manage to destroy. Just then, Shu tells Kai to strike through the machine while it is still in the portal. This is going to be a win for them because the portal is connected to space, and this is where they have been trying to access. Rudolph tries to stop them, but he fails. Kai creates a hole through, giving the ship to fly through. The rest of the warriors engage Rudolph to keep him from following the ship. Rudolph gets angry and promises to wipe everyone out. The clown cannot be happier to hear this because she is ready to support Rudolph in whatever he does. Once they are in space, the ship ends up destroying the entirety of the world-killing machines to make sure none of it is sent back to Lingaland. Once the machines are out of the way, the ship sees a way through to the Holy Land. They plan to break through the wall so that they can meet the divine their first attack falls off pretty badly, and just then, a strange man appears from behind the wall. The man transforms into his suit or armor, and he looks just like Arrow. It seems the final enemy is going to be a copy of Arrow himself. Meanwhile, the entirety of the human force is now fighting Rudolph. They manage to damage him, which is a surprise, but it seems his connection to the divine being is getting weaker. Everyone throws what they have at him, and just when they think they have defeated him, he comes back stronger. He beats everyone up like they are nothing but Fine is there to heal them yet again. Rudolph goes after Fine while the clown tries to eliminate Prax. At the same time, Arrow creates a large number of clones to go after the strange man, but he easily destroys everything. The guy is about to wipe them out when Atlee mentions something quite interesting. She wants to know if the divine is so cruel that he won't care to listen to anything that they want to say. Atli thinks they at least deserve to know why they are being destroyed or wiped out. Once the Divine Man hears this, he decides to show them why they are being targeted for destruction. Years ago, a fleet of ships carrying the Divine Being's ancestors voyaged through space but got hit by a dangerous epidemic. The Divine is born in the midst of this problem, and to sustain the baby, the Lin system is created. This is the system where humans are cultivated for their convictions to sustain the baby. This is when it finally dawns on Shu that the baby is the divine 
while their world was only created to sustain the baby. Arrow was sent to destroy Lingaland because they were already advancing more than they should. Even after hearing all of this, the group is not ready to give up. They still try to take on the Divine Man in an attempt to defeat him. The Strange Man then renders them pretty powerless by removing the entire conviction in the area. Their ships are left scattered and their suits useless. Just when Rudolph is about to unalive the princess, finds Alter Ego and Zetsu shows up. This is a shock to everyone, but the presence of these two immediately changes the game. These are pretty crazy and powerful at the same time which gives Rudolph a really tough time. It turns out that the two are able to come back because their data have not yet been sent as energy after they died. However, the two are still nothing but data at the moment. This doesn't stop them from beating up Rudolph with the support of the warriors. The entire group comes together and launches Rudolph and his puppet into the divine realm to finish them off. To even put the two into use, they are converting them into conviction energy to be used by Arrow. Their energy arrives just at the right time, giving them just what they need to come back to the fight. The ship comes back together to give the Divine Man a fierce fight, but they are soon surrounded by a bunch of Terminator machines. The ship is hit with powerful blasts that almost send them out, but their determination and a strong will that keep them afloat. When Arrow realizes that they cannot beat the Divine Man, no matter what they do, he immediately suggests that he take the baby back to the world where it actually belongs. Arrow promises to look after the Divine and get it back to where it is supposed to be. All Arrow wants in return for this is that they leave Lingaland alone. The Divine Man doesn't want to take them up on this offer, because he is pretty sure they do not have what it takes to be around the Divine Being. However, the entire team vouches on Arrow's behalf, telling the man that Arrow is up to the task. When the man refuses their offer, the group tries to take him out, but fails at this. Just when the man is about to unalive them, the Divine Being releases pulse energy to give his go-ahead. It turns out that the Divine has accepted Arrow's offer, and he gets rid of the Divine Man since he is no longer needed. The group is then taken through a bunch of spaces so that they can at least get an understanding of how things are going. They finally get to where the baby is, and with what Shu can figure, the baby has been sleeping for 2,000 years. Shu is now very interested in the system, and the idea that he might actually meet the person who created the system. A month later, the team is ready to explore space and take the baby to its original home. They are leaving Kai and Fine in charge of Lingaland. Everyone is to work together to rebuild the broken world. The series ends with a group fixing the land while the other is in charge of taking the divine to where it belongs. Thanks for sticking around till the end of the video. Remember to smash that like button and subscribe for more awesome content. Got an anime you're dying to see recapped? Drop it in the comments and we'll make it happen. Catch you.